I'm Jim Byron, President and CEO of the Richard Nixon Foundation. 50 years ago tomorrow, after four years of delicate on and off again negotiations and military actions by the Nixon administration, Secretary of State William Rogers signed the Paris Peace Accords for the United States. What was not on and off again and was in fact very consistent was the approach that President Nixon took in leading his administration's attempts to leverage great power rivalries and competition for America's benefit, the overriding objective of which was to end the war in Vietnam. To discuss Nixon's grand strategy for ending the war in Vietnam, I'm pleased to welcome Pierre Asselin, the Dwight E. Stanford Chair in American Foreign Relations at San Diego State University, Neil Ferguson, Millibank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Rana Mitter, Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China, University of Oxford, my colleague Mark Updegrove, President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation in Austin, Texas, will moderate this discussion, and I turn it over now to Mark. Thanks so much, Jim, and uh, welcome, Neil, Pierre, Rana, for what I know will be a very enlightening discussion on President Nixon's grand strategy to end the war in Vietnam and the, the, the peace agreement that came into play 50 years ago uh, tomorrow. Uh, but but I should remind our audience that you can get into this discussion as well by tweeting your questions to at Nixon Foundation, or if you're so inclined, emailing them to info at nixonfoundation.org. Uh, so gentlemen, let's start with, uh, before we get into the Nixon administration, what was going on in Vietnam and the world prior to Nixon taking office in January of 1969? Uh, Pierre, let's start with you. How would you characterize the situation in Vietnam leading up to the Nixon presidency uh, in 1969? I, I think that one of the elements that, that that Americans looking at the war in Vietnam tend to forget is that fundamentally, whatever's going on in Vietnam by the time Nixon becomes president is 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 a civil war. Uh, the the this this the civil war breaks out in, in in 1945 as 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 the communists attempt to assert uh, their jurisdiction over all of the Vietnamese geo body, uh, and then and then it gets kind of dramatically escalated, intensified and internationalized owing to 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 the Cold War. The French will attempt to recolonize starting in, in late 45, 46. And essentially at that point, the, 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 the French war becomes kind of juxtaposed over this, this ongoing Vietnamese civil war. And then as, as we know, the French eventually leave, the Americans come in, but, but that, 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 that civil war is, is, is ongoing. So, so we have a kind of a 30-year civil war that unfolds in Vietnam as the French, then the Americans, Johnson, and then, and then, and then, and then Nixon become involved in, 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 in all of this. So, so when, when, when Nixon's elected to, to, to the presidency, I mean, fundamentally, again, for the Vietnamese, it doesn't really change anything. Of course, it raises concerns in Hanoi because, because the, the, the North Vietnamese have an understanding of the kind of man Nixon is. Uh, it, it, it kind of elevates uh, optimism somewhat in, in, in Saigon, um, but, but it really remains to be seen how Nixon will kind of change dynamics among Vietnamese themselves and and and, and between northern and northern and, and, and southern Vietnam. Neil, how would you put uh, American perspective during the same period? What's happening here in America? Well, of course, Pierre is right. The United States, in a way, becomes the heir, unwitting heir of a French project of of recolonization, and it's important to recognize that the mission creep was quite gradual. Uh, one, could, one could say it even began under Eisenhower. It certainly was going on under John F. Kennedy. But it was Lyndon Johnson who allowed the American uh, commitment to South Vietnam to escalate massively. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that this was one of the greatest failures of of American foreign policy making, a failure partly of process. Uh, Johnson was not uh, a great strategist. He was a great domestic political operator. But when he took the tactics that had made him master of the Senate and applied them to foreign policy, the results were, were pretty bad. He was, of course, aided and abetted by an incredibly talented national security team 
And so this was a failure uh, in many ways made in Harvard. And uh, and, and that's important to, to bear in mind that, that Richard Nixon inherits a, a mess made by two previous Democratic administrations, uh, a mess that, that gets half a million American soldiers embroiled in a huge uh, ground uh, war that they are struggling uh, not to lose. That is the strong impression that the American public has uh, by 1968. Uh, it's the destruction of Johnson's own ambitions. It uh, rules out a second term for him. It is the dominant issue of domestic politics in 1968, uh, although, of course, there were many other burning issues at that time, not, not least uh, race relations. It's hard for us today. We, we keep telling ourselves that the country's terribly divided today, uh, that we have appalling polarization. And, and yet, when you go back and look at the atmosphere in 1968, when uh, uh, leading figures were being assassinated and the violence in uh, cities and on campuses was much worse than anything uh, we've seen in recent times, you, you realize that that really was uh, an extraordinary time of upheaval uh, in American politics. And I think I'll add a couple more points. It can't be understood separately from the Cold War, the grand and sustained global struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. Although there's this legacy of decolonization, the real story here is that the Soviets uh, in arming North Vietnam were hoping to succeed where they had not succeeded in Korea. They had not managed to uh, gain total control of the uh, Korean Peninsula, but here in Vietnam, there seemed a better shot. Of, a, of achieving total communist control of all of, of, of Vietnam and perhaps all of Indochina, because it's worth saying from the outset that we talk about a Vietnam war, but uh, Cambodia and Laos were soon to be drawn uh, into the conflict. And I think none of this makes sense until one realizes that the United States by 1968 was discovering the limits of its power. If that power had seemed unlimited when John F. Kennedy was sworn in. By 1968, the limits were all too clear, partly in economic terms, but more in terms of what American domestic consensus could take. And what it clearly could not take already by 1968 was the necessary effort to win the war in Vietnam. And that's that's the mess that Richard Nixon inherited. I'll I'll pause there. Uh, let me just ask a, a follow-up question. What is Lyndon Johnson's principal failure in his strategy in Vietnam to that point? Well, I think it was uh, Henry Kissinger who became Nixon's national security advisor who, who got this right. Uh, at the time, criticizing uh, Johnson in his role as Nelson Rockefeller's uh, a close advisor, Johnson tended to think uh, in terms of of boxing, and he would throw punches. Uh, but the, the throwing of punches, uh, whether it was uh, air power or, uh, or ground forces, was not well coordinated, this was Kissinger's critique, with the diplomatic moves that Johnson made. Kissinger wrote a damning a foreign affairs article about the war in Vietnam shortly before he discovered he was going to be Nixon's national security advisor. This was quite embarrassing. He wanted to try and avoid the article being published, but it was too late. And the article reads extremely well today, not surprisingly, because Kissinger had been to Vietnam several times in the mid-60s, had been tangentially involved in Johnson's peacemaking efforts. And it's in that article that, that Kissinger sets out the near impossibility of, of victory. Uh, and sketches out how he imagines it might be possible to salvage uh, what came to be known as peace with honor. Uh, and I'm, I'm struck as I, I revisit that essay and then think about the subsequent events by how, how consistent Kissinger was. He certainly had no illusions going into the White House in 1969 that this war could somehow be won. 
from the outset, he understood his role as being to extricate the United States from an unwinnable war against a guerrilla enemy that had ultimately time on its side and the motivation of its people on its on its side. Uh, and I think the critique of, of Johnson stands up well too. If I I used to teach a course at at uh, Harvard, perhaps Rana, when he moves there, can create something similar. And one of the cl classes in that course focused on the decision to escalate uh, that Johnson took after his election victory of 1964. And it's a fascinating case study in strategic disaster, because the arguments for escalation are so constrained by Lyndon Johnson's domestic political priorities that the US escalates enough to get completely bogged down with a massive land army. I mean, just reflect on how much bigger this was than any deployments in Iraq or Afghanistan. It deploys this vast force and yet does not do enough to win, doesn't even have a clear vision of what victory looks like. So it is, I think it is a case study uh, in strategic failure. And the failure was Lyndon Johnson's. I think one has to understand in any discussion like this, that Richard Nixon inherited an almost unsalvageable failure from his predecessor. And a lot of subsequent discussion uh, forgets that until mm. one almost feels reading, oh, I don't know, Christopher Hitchens uh, at his most polemical, that it was Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger that started the the Vietnam on that their hard task was to try to extricate the United States from its biggest strategic blunder. And I want to underline how hard that task was. The notion that one hears sometimes from the armchairs of academia that there was an easy way out, I think we must be very skeptical about. Hmm. Rana, let's pan out to the world. What is happening in the world just prior to Nixon taking the White House in 69? Thanks, Mark. Well, you know, we've had such a lot laid out there for us that giving the bigger picture is quite the uh, quite the challenge. I want to start to answer that question by first focusing in on the country, which, of course, very soon would be at the centre of attention for Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, and that, of course, is China. And I think it's an understanding China, and it's part as a uh, it's part of that global triangular relationship with the Soviet Union and with the United States that we have to understand the wider context of what happens eventually in 1973 with the Paris Peace Accords. But 1969 is setting the ground for that. So first of all, I think it's worth remembering that this is a period when the Cold War is in a very, very unstable environment, sometimes with those three legs, if you want to call it that, the People's Republic of China, the Soviet Union, and the United States of America. We might think of it as a tripod, but if so, it's a tripod where the third leg, if that's what China is, is slightly different length to the others and slightly unstable. And I think that's not necessarily a bad analogy for why this period is is so difficult. And it's important because actually, um, I'll, I'll stop the tripod analogy at this stage, I don't want to take it, take it too far. But in terms of the Chinese desire to try and remake its position in the world, a lot of what's going on both at home and abroad shape that question of how the Cold War develops, actually really for the remaining 20 years of its existence into the 1980s. So first, just one domestic thing about China before I widen out for a minute or two into, into the world again. And that is that this is a period of the utmost turmoil. It is the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution has kicked off in 1966. It's at its height between 66 and the beginning of 69, the Red Guard period, the one that, of course, has become uh, you know, an icon in millions of photographs, Mao standing at the center of Tiananmen Square in the center of Beijing, and fervent young men and women waving little red books while wearing green uniforms. And for, from the foreign policy point of view, this made this an absolutely hopeless time to try and have a sensible conversation. So I think we have to accept a great deal of what Neil has said in terms of LBJ and his shortcomings. But we should remember that there was one important element when he was looking to try and make, at least when his State Department was trying to have sensible conversations with the Chinese, the 
opportunities to do that were very heavily limited by the fact that half the time the foreign ministry in Beijing was being surrounded by 17 year olds who were basically throwing paint bombs and demanding that the place be burnt to the ground, which uh, uh, makes the writing of diplomatic telegrams a little more challenging than it might uh, necessarily be in, in more normal uh, more normal times. But that didn't mean that China wasn't looking at the world around it and working out how Vietnam fitted in. And one thing we have to remember is that China was an immensely important actor in terms of the way in which the Vietnamese civil war, which Pierre has told us about, um, um, unfolded. It was a civil war, of course, but a civil war that lived in the world of the Cold War. And in this particular case, as you know, great historians of this period, um, Professor Chang Jai comes to mind with his book on the uh, uh, China and the Vietnam Wars, is that it moves to a period in which the actor doing containment, a term we almost always associate, of course, with the United States, is not the Americans in this case, but the Chinese. They want to contain the Vietnamese. They want to contain the Vietnamese revolution. And they are more and more worried that the turn of the Vietnamese is towards the enemy from China's point of view, which of course is the Soviet Union. Recall that, of course, just a few years previously in 1960, you had the final um, open split between the Soviets and the communist Chinese, which, of course, had been brewing up ever since the uh, the death of Stalin and the rise of Khrushchev. But by the time you get to the mid to late 1960s, 1969, remember, is the year when China and the Soviet Union pretty much nearly went to war. They went to war, um, nearly went to war over the Junbao Islands and the Asuri River. And there was certainly uh, a, a fear on the Chinese side that this might well turn nuclear. So there are a whole variety of uh, constraints that mean that China at this stage really, really needs to orient its foreign policy towards speaking towards the Americans. And I won't go further than that now, because I know we're going to move towards the 1970s a little later on. But let me Thank just you. add, wait, sorry. No, no, go get right now. I'm, I'm just going to add one, one or two other things that also add a little further context in terms of this liminal period of the very late 60s before we go into the, the mm. early 70s. First is to remind ourselves actually about Indochina. Pierre's just talked about Vietnam. He'll talk more about the region later, I'm sure. And uh, Neil, I think, actually just mentioned um, Cambodia as well in that, that context. This is the year when the revolution is blowing up that will finally, within a few months in 1970, throw Prince Sihanouk or King Sihanouk off the throne and essentially put for a very short period a pro-American Khmer Republic in power under Lon Nol initially. Now, this is also a reorientation of policy, which actually gladdens hearts in Beijing, because by this stage, supporting Cambodian movements that are not going to follow the Vietnamese and therefore Soviet line is very important to them. And you see the seeds there of what they do just a few years later, perhaps the most unforgivable action committed both by the PRC and by the United States in different ways, which was support of the genocidal Khmer Rouge. And whatever else you say about the Vietnamese a little later on, they did put a stop to that particular um, ugly disaster. One other element, final one in my um, uh, explanation here, and then I'll, I'll stop, but it does relate also very much to Nixon and Kissinger and their global view, at least of, of Asia. And that is, of course, what's happening in India at this time, because we're only about a year and a half from the conflict that becomes the Bangladesh Liberation War. At this point, Pakistan is still one country with two parts. Indira Gandhi's India is undergoing a whole variety of internal troubles that will eventually lead in the mid-70s to the emergency period. But at this point, the real crisis is an international one. It's one about whether or not East Pakistan is going to uh, break off. We know, of course, eventually that it does. And as many people will know, not least if they've read the, the great work of, of Gary Bass, for instance, that the question of how the Pakistan, uh, the Pakistan-India war and the Bangladesh Liberation War is going to be dovetailed with the Pakistani role in Nixon and Kissinger's uh, approach to China and how that will also be seen in Beijing becomes part of the complexity that makes the Asian arena a very, very complicated one, not just if you're looking from Washington or Moscow, but also if you're looking on from Beijing in the middle of that cultural revolution. Thank you, Rana. Pierre, I think you wanted to add a point. Just, yeah, just a, a, a few things. You know, uh, we're, you know we're, we're talking about America limits to American power. I think Neil Neil mentioned that, right? And then and then and then kind of errors made by the Johnson administration. But I think it's really important to recognize also that that whatever mistakes the Americans made, 
uh, the outcome of the of the war was, I think, I think shaped more by what the other side did right. You know, I mean, we're not, you know, by the by the time the Americans come in in '65, we're we're not talking in about 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 enemies consisting of guerrillas. We're talking about 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 a multi divisional army that's very well equipped. You know, I mean, even even by 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 the time the French war comes to an end, the what becomes the North Vietnamese army is a multi divisional army. I mean, by you know, ten years later, when when the American war begins, that army is, I would argue, it's 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 more. It's 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 better trained. Uh, it's it's more disciplined, uh, and it's 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 far more motivated than than the American military. And it's very important to recognize that. Of course, the Vietnamese are going to kind of play that that oh we're just a bunch of poor peasants, right? But reali realistically speaking, uh, the 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 air defense systems provided by the Soviet Union are are remarkable, and the small arms that the Chinese give to the North Vietnamese that are used to basically. Uh, 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 go after American and allied forces in the South are as good as the Chinese have. So, so when we look at all of this, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to, to underscore, you know, failures on the part of, of Kennedy, Johnson, and eventually Nixon. But it's really, really important to get beyond this idea that Americans are, are, are fighting peasant men and women here. I mean, they're, they're, they're fighting, again, when you look at the North Vietnamese Army at the time, I would argue one of the best armed forces in the whole world. And that in itself, to me, goes a long way toward explaining the outcome of the war. So, so, so the situation is tough by the time Nixon comes to power, but, but, but it's tough because of how, 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 because of the fact that essentially the North Vietnamese are waging and throughout the period will wage a better war. Ron, let me come back to you before we jump into the Nixon presidency uh, and its very groundbreaking approach to, to, to China. How did Kennedy and Johnson view China in, in the geopolitical world? Yeah, no, well, there's some work, um, again, I'm thinking of the historian uh, Michael Lumbers, for instance, who have done really important work in looking at trying to break down a little bit what has become uh, a myth, perhaps a bit self-perpetuated, that only Nixon could have gone to China and opened up. And certainly there's a very good argument that the way it was done fitted a particular geopolitical turn and that moment extremely well. But actually, the attempts to open up conversations in the 1960s under Kennedy and under Johnson, at sort of lower levels of the administration, rather than necessarily at that kind of top level presidential um, uh, uh, level, are certainly visible during that time. There are, of course, channels of communication uh, amongst other places in Warsaw, which enable uh, diplomats from both sides to be able to talk to each other in the context of um, uh, another Cold War intermediary city. The problem came with a combination of the fact that it has to be, of course, remembered that the major issue from the point of view of the Soviet Union and the United States remained each other for most of that period. Now that the Soviet Union, as I, you know, my, my undergraduates never believed that anything called the Soviet Union really existed for real living people like me. They sort of assume it's like Bohemia or Ruritania one of those sort of legends historians make up to, to please themselves. But at the time, it was clearly very, very central in that sort of uh, imagination. And combined with the fact that foreign policy really became very, very difficult indeed to operate in the Cultural Revolution, along with the overall, and again, just worth remembering, we, we know this, but sometimes it's, 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 it's hard to realise it, the fact that China did not have proper diplomatic relations with the United States and actually really with a variety of other major Western powers. It didn't have full diplomatic relations with Britain uh, until 72, uh, and there are other examples as well. Along with the fact, of course, it doesn't have the United Nations seat either, so there's no chance of having those behind-the-scenes conversations in New York, which you could do for the Soviets and various other uh, countries which the US found problematic. So all of that, I think, came together to mean that the, the attempts that were made and were real were useful in terms of brush clearing, but it did take that real change, that shift uh, in the late 60s, early 70s to uh, bring about the change that we now think of as the American approach to China and vice versa. So Richard Nixon comes into office 54 years ago this month, and he does so after campaigning with a platform that included a secret plan for peace in Vietnam. Neil, what was Nixon's hope for Vietnam when he took office 54 years ago. Well, it's fascinating to go back to the deliberations uh, of 1969, the very first 
national security study uh, that the Nixon administration commissioned was on Vietnam. And Kissinger's role was, in a sense, to canvas opinion from all the many agencies that had a Vietnam policy. Uh, he'd made the point before coming into office that there really wasn't a Vietnam strategy. There were all just a bunch of agencies pursuing their own uh, strategies. Uh, and in the course of 1969, there was a heated debate within the administration. And that debate ultimately produced the idea of Vietnamization. Mm -hmm. And it took months to arrive at that decision. But the key decision was to start reducing the number of US uh, troops in Vietnam and to do it in return for nothing. Uh, and this uh, was an argument strongly favored by uh, the Secretary of Defense, Mel Laird, and opposed by Kissinger, who mm -hmm. thought that it would, uh, he used the analogy of salted peanuts, the more troops came home, the more troops Americans would want to come home. But that was a key decision of, of 1969. And it's important to emphasize uh, that Richard Nixon, with astonishing speed, reduced the number of American troops uh, mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Now, that didn't mean some kind of surrender was intended. On the contrary, Nixon also wanted to apply pressure on Hanoi, even as he was withdrawing troops. How did he do this? Well, the first step in this direction was to bomb uh, North Vietnamese uh, bases in Cambodia, uh, to do it secretly. Uh, and, uh, and this, I think, is the key to what Nixon had in mind. Because he had an extraordinarily sophisticated grasp of what would fly in American politics, he knew that he had to get the troops out and reduce the casualty numbers. You know, enormous numbers of American young men were being killed mm -hmm. uh, in the battlefields of Vietnam in 1968. Nixon's first goal was to try to reduce that number. But to avoid abandoning uh, South Vietnam, he had to do something to apply a pressure. And I think that's the first... I think that's the first thing to get across, mm -hmm. uh, that Nixon was seeking to use air power as a substitute for ground forces, something that the United States had been doing in warfare since the 1940s. Uh, and uh, for the generation like Nixon and Kissinger and most members of the administration who'd fought in World War II, it was by no means counterintuitive to do that, reduce the body count of American dead and use American superior air power to try uh, to influence the outcome of the war. The key decision which gets us into the realm of the counterfactual was not to use that air power directly against North Vietnam in 1969. There are two big counterfactuals that we should maybe talk about. What ifs? The what if one hears about a lot is, well, what if they had just thrown in the towel um, and, and essentially abandoned the effort to prop up South Vietnam, accepted the terms that the North Vietnamese uh, repeatedly put on the table in 1969. I mean, I don't think that's a realistic counterfactual. I can't imagine if Hubert Humphrey had won the election that he would have done that. But the mm. other counterfactual is the one that Kissinger and Nixon subsequently talked about. What if the US had escalated earlier, had hit Hanoi and Haiphong earlier, rather than waiting really until 1972 to use the full might of, of American air power against, directly against North Vietnamese targets. I think that's a more challenging and interesting counterfactual. I'm not sure that they would have had the domestic uh, basis to do it. Uh, I think it's important to remember, as I mentioned earlier, the febrile atmosphere of 1969 uh, and the constraints, the protests that were going on in Washington itself and all over the country uh, that led Nixon to a very important conclusion. And this is the last thing I want to say. Everybody was aware of the anti-war movement. It was all over the campuses. It was all over the newspapers. It was all over the television, which played such a big part in American politics then. Uh, and there were great internal deliberations about what to do about this anti-war movement that seemed to be so electrifying, particularly to young Americans. Nixon in the fall of 1969 has an epiphany, and it is that although they're noisy, they're not a majority. And he understands correctly, I think, that there's a, he calls it silent majority of Americans who really don't have this very negative view of American power. They want the war to be over, but they don't want surrender. And Nixon decides to triangulate, if you like, to make his policy directed towards that constituency, because, of course, he's already thinking about re-election. 
uh, mm-hmm. in 1972. And Nixon understands that what he's going to do has to satisfy the silent majority of Americans who don't want the war to keep going, who really don't anticipate some kind of victory, but they do not want to bug out a phrase that was much uh, used at that time. So that, I think, is the way to think about the early strategic decision-making. Um, I'll leave to to, uh, to Rana uh, the significance of, of China, uh, but, but let me kind of provide, if I may, some linkage to what Rana's about to say. They knew that it wasn't enough to apply pressure to North Vietnam. They realized that the way to bring this war to a conclusion was indirectly by applying pressure on the two powers that were supporting the North Vietnamese war effort, the Soviet Union and China, both of which were supplying weapons and uh, and indeed personnel to the North Vietnamese war effort. So from the outset, and I think this was Kissinger's uh, particular contribution, the goal was to try to find ways of incentivizing the Soviets in particular to stop supplying so much weaponry uh, mm. to, uh, to North Vietnam. And, and try to find incentives was a big part of the early phase of uh, the Nixon administration. Hey, you want to do strategic arms limitation? Well, you better cut us some slack in Vietnam. You want to have a conversation about the Middle East? What about Vietnam? And all the time in his endless interactions with the Soviet ambassador, Anatoly Dobrynin, Kissinger's trying to find some way of getting in return for concessions in other domains, some help with Vietnam. In the end, it doesn't work. But, and this is my link, uh, my linkage to Rana, there is one extraordinarily clever move that really does put the Soviets under pressure. And that, of course, involves Beijing. Rana? <laughs> Rana, please, yeah, please talk about that. The, 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 how China and the Soviet Union come to bear uh, in the plans that, that Nixon and Kissinger are putting uh, into place around uh, uh, Vietnam in order to strike what they hope will be an honorable peace. Absolutely. Well, it's worth remembering, and again, just to sort of have the kind of chain of continuity here in a couple of minutes, I think Pierre is going to come back in on, on, on the Vietnamese, is that every single one of these major actors, China, the United States, the Soviet Union, is seeking to use the Vietnamese revolution as a tool in in service of its own ideological aims. And the Vietnamese Vietnamese themselves have rather different ideas in many cases, not least about how they want to construct their own country. But let's look at that geopolitical scheme that is being uh, woven at uh, at this particular moment. First of all, It's absolutely right to say, as Neil just did, that both the Soviet Union and the Chinese are supplying arms to the Vietnamese, and both of them do want the Vietnamese revolution to succeed. But of course, rather like um, warring parents who aren't talking to each other, they want the the Vietnamese revolution to succeed for rather different reasons, and they'd rather that the other parent didn't get get the credit. So in this particular case, there is a very strong sense on the part of the um, Chinese that they do want the Vietnamese to have a successful revolution, but perhaps rather more slowly than the Soviets want them to do. And that's one of the dynamics that really shapes what's going on here during uh, during during these years. So to give a particular example, um, there are visits from some of the top Vietnamese communists to Beijing when they get wind of the idea that it may be the case that Mao and Joe Enlai are going to invite Richard Nixon to mm. the US president to visit um, visit China. And the Vietnamese, at least some of the Vietnamese communists, really don't think this is a very good idea. They're not keen for this to happen at all. And they're saying that in large part by this stage under Soviet influence, because clearly it's not in the interest of the Soviet Union for the Americans and the Chinese to be getting close together. Whereas China by this stage is still essentially playing again, Chiang Jai have mentioned before, we'll bring him here again, has called a dual policy. In other words, of supporting the Vietnamese revolution with arms and ideological input and all of those elements, but also trying to play 
another string in which they are uh, maximizing their own position with regard to the Americans as well. So they know perfectly well, sorry, the Beijing, uh, Mao, Zhou and, uh, Zhou and Lai and others know perfectly well that the Americans are in a mess in Vietnam and they need to be uh, pulled out of it, so to uh, so to speak. And that's clearly a very important part of the uh, deliberations that are going on during uh, the uh, the internal debates in Beijing about whether there should be an invitation to uh, Nixon at all. And don't forget, there are prominent people, many of them associated with the more leftist radical faction in Beijing, uh, Jiang Qing, the wife of, uh, of um, uh, of, of Mao and the other figures who become part of that group that sometimes becomes known as the Gang of Four are really, again, not very enthusiastic for this direction. And again, while much of the detail of why Lin Biao, the then uh, leader designate um, to follow Mao, the defense minister, uh, who in 1971 took off in still very mysterious circumstances with his family in uh, a fighter jet fleeing uh, Beijing and crashed in, in outer Mongolia, all of this is linked to a whole variety of issues, including domestic politics. But the question of opening to America is very central to uh, to all of that. So in that particular set of circumstances, the, the desire of Beijing to essentially try and play both tracks is a very important part of its outreach to America because it knows that the Soviets are not going to be pleased with that. It's also an important part of the developing situation in terms of Chinese support for the opposition in Cambodia, which will also blow up and become much more of an issue during the years, both leading up to the Paris Peace Accords and afterwards as well. But again, if we have, we're playing, we play Jane, I should say that Pierre would probably have quite a lot to say about what the Vietnamese thought about the Chinese approach as well. Well, that, that's precisely where we'll go, Rana. Uh, Pierre, let me let me just go back to the, the speech that, uh, that Neil referenced that President uh, Nixon delivered on November 3rd, 1969, in which he talked about the silent majority, but he talked about the, the, the changing approach to the war uh, from the new administration. He said, in the previous administration, we Americanized the war in Vietnam. In this administration, we are Vietnamizing the war for peace. What was the response to what became known as, as Neil mentioned, as Vietnamization uh, by the, the, the Vietnamese? How did they respond? So, so just, you know, Nixon is not, again, it's a, it's a Vietnamese civil war, right? It's always been a Vietnamized war. What Nixon's really doing is de-Americanizing the war, right? So, so the, the, the Vietnam War, the Vietnamese Civil War, is Americanized in '65, and then and then and then undergoes a process of gradual de-Americanization in in starting in in, in 1969, right? So, so and slowly but gradually, we're going to return to the pre-65 situation in 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 Vietnam, right? So, so for the Vietnamese, the response doesn't really matter much. Uh, and this idea of, 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 of Vietnamization simply means what both Hanoi and Saigon expected all along, that at some point the Americans would either capit capitulate or, 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 or leave gradually or, or, or suddenly. Uh, just a quick note here because about, about Nixon's strategy, right? Because uh, France is looming very large here. Mm. Th th this idea of Vietnamization as Nixon presents it, right? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's essentially based on the French policy of jaunissement which they, they, they introduced in 1949, right? Starting in 49, the, 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 the French tried to alleviate the burden on their own forces and colonial forces by, by making more Vietnamese fight. And they call this the yellow wing of the war, right? Le jaunissement de la guerre. And that's basically, in a way, what Nixon's doing here, right? And then, and then, and then beyond that, in terms of kind of talking about peace with honor, that's the Gaulle in Algeria, right? For the Gaulle, it wasn't peace with honor. It, it was basically peace in honor, like la, la, la pedale en oil. And then when you look at Nixon taking his time to pull back, that's, that's again, the Gaulle in Algeria, right? It took the Gaulle four years to get France out of Algeria. So, so France is, is looming very, very large in, 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 in all of this. Uh, a point about the Soviets and the Chinese, right? Of course, they're, I mean, they're, they're really providing a lot of assistance to, 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 to Hanoi. But, but what's really shocking about all of this is that, is that Hanoi, despite all of this, never feels beholden to either Moscow or, or Beijing. Hanoi is just shockingly autonomous throughout this whole process. As Saigon, by the way, is going to be vis-a-vis -vis the Americans, Nixon's about to find out in late 1972. So, so, so hard as they'll put pressure on, on, on Hanoi to desist, 
none of this will really amount to anything. And if, 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 if anything, as much as, as the Soviets, the Chinese are trying to use the Vietnamese to meet their ends, I would argue that the Vietnamese are much more successful at using the Soviets and the Chinese to meet their own uh, 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 rather, rather narrow and, and, and revolutionary uh, aims as, as they themselves understood, understood them. You know, the, the launching of the Spring Offensive in 1972, right, which is actually bigger than the Tet Offensive, I mean, I mean, there was no consultation of Beijing or Moscow. In fact, both the Chinese and the Soviets are shocked, angry, surprised by, by all of this. And to me, it's just a testament to, to not only the, the audacity of Hanoi, but also to its independence relative to, to, to its allies. And, and that's the thing. I mean, it's, you know, certainly Nixon will score big by going to Moscow and to, to Beijing in 1972, but it, it, it doesn't translate into anything as far as the Soviets and the Chinese and their influence on Hanoi is concerned. Hanoi will become concerned about potential abandonment, but but it's it's, it's a response to Hanoi's own strategic calculations and not and not to what the Soviets or the Chinese are 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 telling them to do. And and again, going back to the Soviets and the Chinese, Hanoi understands how flaky they are. Mm. At the onset of war in '65, right when you look at 1965, the Soviets don't want this war. The Soviets are going to actively urge Hanoi to negotiate with the Americans. And, and the Chinese, on the other hand, are pushing really, really hard in 63, 64, for Hanoi to actually go to war in, 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 in the South. And part of that is a manifest, manifestation of the Sino, Sino-Soviet split, right? And the next thing you know, the Soviets become more engaged in the war, especially after the US starts rolling thunder, the sustained bombing of, of Northern Vietnam, as the Chinese then start to reconsider their militant stance vis-a-vis uh, the war in Vietnam and then and then and then the world revolutionary process in, in general. And I know he's aware of all of these things, right? That that its own allies, reliable as they are in terms of providing hardware for 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 the fight, can also be kind of you know fickle when it comes to their own strategic priorities. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why why Hanoi never really kind of pays close attention to what the Soviets, the Chinese are telling them, which which by the way, the Soviets and the Chinese will complain about. Um, I found these great documents in the French archives where Soviet diplomats in Hanoi are telling their French counterparts that, that you know, we really feel sorry for you, the French, having to fight these guys and try to colonize them because, you know, we're, we're, we're their friends and they're not talking to us, they're not telling us anything. They're mm-hmm. treating us as, as, as though we're, we're nothing to them, which, which again, you know, given Vietnamese strategic purposes, Vietnamese communist strategic purposes, uh, became, became kind of a, a non-issue despite the fact that they're so heavily reliant on assistance from the Soviets and, 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 and the Chinese. Here, you touched on this, but let me just follow up with this. Uh, how can Hanoi be so boldly defiant to these two behemoths, China and the Soviet Union? How is that possible for them? Hanoi understands the Sino-Soviet split better than anyone else in, in the world, I would, I would argue. So they know that whatever they do to the Soviets, the Soviets will still have to support them if only so as to not justify Chinese denunciations of the Soviets as as revisionists who don't care about the world revolution and vice versa, right? The Chinese, one of the kind of the central features of of the Sino-Soviet split is is the Chinese claiming that that they are the true standard bearer of the world Marxist-Leninist cause. And the Vietnamese understand this. So, so, So whatever they tell the Chinese, they don't really have to care because they know the Chinese will have to keep supporting them if only so that their image internationally remains one of China committed to world revolution and being more Marxist-Leninist than, 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 than Moscow. There's, there's, a, there's a remarkable strategic manipulation here on the part of Hanoi, of, of, of the Soviet Union and the Chinese. And, and ironically enough, for this Sino-Soviet split, which could have been a serious liability for Hanoi, turns out to be one of its biggest assets. I mean, I mean, uh, again, the Soviets never wanted this war in Vietnam, but they get into it because of the Sino-Soviet split. Because after, once the Americans start bombing, then, then, then they're on the spot. Will you help a Marxist-Leninist ally? Or will you abandon it as the Chinese have argued you abandoned Cuba in 62. And so, 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 you know, just like, you know, Johnson in a way is reluctant to become involved in Vietnam, but does so anyway, the, the, the Soviets, as of 1964, 65, are similarly very reluctant about getting involved in Vietnam. But 
as, as Ron and Neil have mentioned, because of larger considerations, because for the Soviets, the Chinese, like for the Americans, this was never about Vietnam. This was about larger geostrategic considerations. For, 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 for the Soviets and the Chinese, this is something that we just have to do, given our commitments to other parts of the world and given how that same world is going to judge us based on our actions in, in Vietnam. You know, the spot, I mean, just like the spotlight is on Ukraine today, at the time it was on Vietnam. You, you just couldn't avoid it. You couldn't ignore it. And the Vietnamese were very much aware of that. And, and through really clever diplomacy, we're able to get guns from the socialist camp as they're getting moral and political support from the third world, from the Western world, including from the Americans themselves, by the way. I mean, that's just genius. Imagine that, right? You, you, you find a way to, to co-opt uh, a segment of the enemy population. So, 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 so again, going back to my earlier point, right? If when we look at, at, at the situation Nixon inherits, and, and fundamentally, his failure to really change a whole lot about it, 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 it has less to do with the things he tried to achieve than what the, the enemy managed to, to, to accomplish. Uh, Neil, let, let's come back to the United States and the Nixon White House. You, you wrote a marvelous book about uh, Henry Kissinger prior to his coming into the White House as President Nixon's national security advisor. But talk about the role that he played in shaping policy in Vietnam and how his views uh, matched up to President Nixon's? Well, they certainly didn't agree about everything. I've already mentioned Kissinger's skepticism uh, about Vietnamization. Uh, and I think there were other points uh, where they, when they differed too. Uh, however, I think they shared a strategic vision uh, which we've talked about already as as the triangular uh, diplomacy, using the opening to China uh, to apply pressure to the Soviet Union. And I think Pierre has identified why that didn't work in the case of Vietnam, but it's worth emphasizing that it worked in a lot of other ways uh, very well, uh, not least, for example, in, in the Middle East. I'll say more about that later because I think it's worth emphasizing that in the great scheme of things, uh, the Middle East mattered more than Indochina. And succeeding there mattered more than failure uh, in Indochina. But failure is a relative uh, concept, isn't it? It didn't look like failure in, in 1972. On the contrary, it looked as if Nixon and Kissinger were geniuses. Hmm. Uh, they had not only got uh, Nixon uh, to go to China, uh, which was one of the great televisual diplomatic triumphs of the 1970s. They had uh, secured a strategic arms limitation uh, agreement with uh, the Soviets. Uh, and on the eve of the election of November 1972, Kissinger was able to say with what seemed like credibility at the time that peace was at hand in Vietnam. And uh, I've been revisiting the media coverage of uh, those events, and it is impressive that even the New York Times is entirely caught up in the excitement of the moment. Uh, at that moment, Nixon and Kissinger are the, the, the really are at the zenith of their of their uh, their careers. Their reputations have them on the front of Time, Time magazine as as men of the year. It's uh, it's it's an astonishing achievement, and so we know, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, that it all falls apart and that South Vietnam uh, has gone within a little over two years. Mm. But they didn't know that then, uh, not even the most skeptical journalists uh, on the New York Times. And I think if one uh, thinks about this carefully, one can see that at the end of 1972 and in January uh, of 1973, there still seemed a plausible chance that South Vietnam would survive the way South Korea had, had survived. I don't think that's a wildly unrealistic counterfactual. I don't think it's true to say that Nixon and Kissinger all along knew that South Vietnam was doomed and were just looking for a decent interval. They sometimes talked that way, 
But at other times, it looked as if there might be a way of keeping the show on the road in, in Saigon. And I'm struck as I read over the documents by the effort that went into uh, the terms of that piece and the seriousness with which all the different components of it were studied. We know it all ended in failure. I don't think that that was absolutely predetermined. And here, uh, I have to mention the the inevitable uh, villain of the piece. Mm. The counterfactual that haunts the Nixon administration must always be, what if there had not been Watergate? What if Nixon's position had not collapsed uh, underneath him because of Watergate? Uh, and more broadly, what if Congress had not seized the weakness of Nixon as an opportunity to assert its complete control over foreign policy with respect at least to aid uh, to South Vietnam. Remember, it's in, in, inconceivable that South Korea would have survived if there hadn't been aid uh, in uh, in the period after the end of the Korean War. But there's no aid for South Vietnam. It's basically cut off. And to this day, uh, Henry Kissinger argues, not, I think, uh, uh, insincerely, that South Vietnam had a shot in 1973, but without sustained American aid, uh, and without, therefore, congressional support, it didn't have a shot. That seems like a very, very important dimension uh, of this story. Neil, you know, uh, uh, before we go to Rana to talk about the, the China dynamic in here, as, as Nixon and Kissinger are looking at the world at this point, what is their top priority? Avoiding World War III. And this is often forgotten, that ultimately, when they sit down in 1969, and hear from the Joint Chiefs what the war plan is, they're both completely appalled. Mm. Because by 1969, the logic of mutually assured destruction has established a scenario in which war with the Soviet Union means the obliteration uh, of the United States and the Soviet Union. And I think we forget that that was the number one priority, making sure that that relationship did not produce another Cuban Missile Crisis. And of course, Cuba was back on the agenda before long in, in Cienfuegos. So I think that's the top priority. And we forget now that making sure that relationship was stable was the number one preoccupation. That's why Kissinger spends so much time with Dobrynin, makes him almost the most important interlocutor that he has in the world. Uh, and I think the way to understand uh, Richard Nixon is in terms of strategic hierarchy. There is a hierarchy of priorities. I've mentioned number one. And then you come down and you say, well, to get some leverage with the Soviets, the opening to China is the ace. Uh, and it's an ace that I don't think Hubert Humphrey would have played. Worth mm. remembering now that Humphrey was entirely conventional in his view that China was just a crazy place that you couldn't deal with. And the key was the Soviet relationship. So I think Nixon is boldly original in accepting the overtures from, uh, from Mao and, and seeing all that could be done with that. And Vietnam's kind of third. Uh, because getting out of Vietnam uh, is something that I don't I don't think by 1973 it's nearly as important as these uh, as these other issues, uh, because by that time, with the American troops home, interest in the war has substantially diminished. It's no longer the number one issue, uh, though it is for some uh, journalists. And I mentioned already the Middle East. In 1973, it becomes clear that that's the place that really matters mm -hmm. in Cold War II, in Cold War I, rather. And in this region, uh, it, it, it really is a tre tremendous uh, American achievement to essentially shut the Soviets out, kick them out. They cease to be major players in the course of 73, 74. So that's, that's the way I would think about this. Vietnam is the number one issue in 1969. It really isn't after the election of 1972. Rana, how does Nixon's plan to open China relate to his grand strategy in Vietnam? Well, at the most basic level, it's clear that there's a whole. I mean, Neil, I think, has it exactly right. Actually, he's right on the on, on the money that essentially neutralizing or making the Vietnam Vietnam War no longer problematic from the point of view of an uh, American electorate mm. goes hand in glove with this wider dynamic, which both, of course, you know, creates the image of Nixon as a statesman who can go places where other people can't. Um, I think I broadly agree with 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 with, with the, Neil. I would say. 
remind again that there were efforts before that to try and open to China. And I, I do slightly wonder even if Hubert Humphrey, you know, counterfactuals are always difficult to, to do, although Neil is, is the master master of them. I uh, know if, if you haven't read his book, Virtual History, I highly recommend you, you do so. But in that context, the idea that actually China, which of course, under its own dynamic, was certainly seeking under its more moderate members of government, Zhou Enlai and others, to open up by the early 1970s, would have simply refused to uh, open up to any kind of possibility of talking to the Americans, I think is less likely. I think something would have happened. But I, I would absolutely say that the boldness of the Nixon-Kissinger gambit is something that shouldn't be denied and absolutely has to be acknowledged as really very, uh, very distinctive. And that fits, I think, into the idea that essentially Asia is broadly speaking reduced in significance overall as an area of immense concern. And so, you know, again, I think um, Neil's sort of, uh, what would you call it, uh, priorities list is a useful thing to have in mind. If by about 1971, two, three, you can argue that to some extent the Nixon Kissinger um, administration has managed to make the East and Southeast Asian uh, uh, arena one that is much, much calmer than it would have seen just a, a few years uh, uh, prior to that. And the eventual uh, fall of, of South Vietnam isn't something that matters um, uh, in the way that it would have done five years previously. That the uh, India-Pakistan question, which I mentioned, which had the potential to break out into a much, much greater and much more destructive war in South Asia, was no longer um, uh, a, a a question that uh, no longer an issue which could have spread further after the ultimate establishment of Bangladesh in, in 1971. The Middle East, uh, and again, 1973, not the greatest year for the Middle East, but nonetheless, um, uh, very, very active efforts to try and calm that down. And a detente program, which actually in many ways holds all the way until the Second Cold War, if you want to call it that, emerges with the freezing again of Soviet-US relations in the early 1980s. It's worth adding one other thing also on the Chinese side that um, uh, perhaps a slightly surprising duo to back up Neil's um, idea, and Pierre's idea, I think, as well, actually, that um, the 1973 Paris peace agreements essentially uh, take uh, take Vietnam sort of off the, off the table as a major issue. The same issue, uh, the same um, judgment, I think, was also made by Mao and by Zhou Enlai, who were actually quite pleased with what they saw emerging from the Paris peace agreements and actually wanted the North Vietnamese uh, to lay off for a bit. I mean, Pierre will have more to say about this probably in a, in a, in a moment. But, you know, basically, uh, Zhou Enlai and the other top Chinese leaders talk to the, the North Vietnamese and say, you know, this is a bit like uh, when uh, we defeated, when Chiang, when the Japanese were defeated in 1945, and we didn't go straight for Chiang Kai-shek. You know, we spent a couple of years trying to look at alternatives, and we took a bit of time to regroup. And you should do that as well. So, yes, of course, you must reunify Vietnam at some point. But need you be in such a hurry? So in that sense, they too, I think, could have been in the category of people who are somewhat surprised that the Thieu regime and the South Vietnamese state disappeared as quickly as it did. Since from the Chinese point of view, if things had gone on a you know, purely linear, linear extrapolation, I think they were expecting that state to certainly be around for much of the 1970s at uh, uh, at least. And therefore, the determination, which of course, as Pierre said, is absolutely the autonomous choice of the North Vietnamese revolutionary movement, I mean, Le Duan and others by, by that stage, um, that no, we're not going to let Beijing tell us what the pace should be. We're not going to, certainly not going to let the uh, the Americans do it, but also the Soviets are, are not our masters on this question. And uh, in the end, the acceleration of the destruction of the South Vietnamese state has a dynamic that is very, very heavily driven by the ideological desires of people in Hanoi, rather than any other superpower Cold War capital. So let me quote President Nixon again, uh, who said, I have initiated a plan which will end this war in a way that will bring us closer to a just and lasting peace. As president, I hold the responsibility for choosing the best path to that goal and then leading the nation along it. So how did he do? I want to ask each of you. By uh, uh, If you look at President Nixon's uh, goal, how did he do in meeting it? And I'll, I'll start with you, Pierre. I, you know, I, 
for, for, for all the criticism that Nixon's been subjected to, much of which he's, he's deserved, I mean, to me, as, as, as someone who studied the war from the Vietnamese communist perspective, that he was able to get any kind of an agreement from the North Vietnamese is quite remarkable. Mm. Um, you know, that, that, that despite what they would claim publicly afterwards and what many historians have claimed about, oh, this just being a piece of paper, this was so much more for the North Vietnamese. Remember, these guys had entered into an agreement with the French in 1954, right? The so-called Geneva Accords. And nothing good that came out of it as far as, 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 as Vietnam's communist leadership was concerned. And so, so when the war with the Americans began, it's very clear that whatever happens, we're never, ever, ever affixing our signature to any sort of a diplomatic settlement. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they, they express a willingness to negotiate at first with Johnson and then with Nixon, but there's no, there's no actual earnest desire to achieve anything tangible unless, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's the unilateral, unconditional withdrawal of U.S. forces, right? But, but then through, through a, a very, very uh, 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 clever application or use of diplomacy, uh, uh, military uh, initiatives uh, and, and other kind of political maneuvering, Nixon manages to put so much pressure on Hanoi that, 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 that he, he, he gets that piece of paper. And, and you know, whether that's peace with honor, I, I think really realistically, it's, it's, it's really an individual call as far as we're concerned. But, but you know, given how intractable Hanoi had been, uh, you know, that Nixon was able to at least get a piece of paper um, to me, I, th th there's, there's, you have to acknowledge a measure of success here. The problem is that for, for Nixon to get that piece of paper, he, he basically had to mortgage his political future. And, and this mm -hmm. is where, you know, as much as we want to blame Congress for what happens after, I mean, you know, all that secrecy, all that bombing, I mean, it, it was bound to take a toll. I think, I think as, you know, as historians of, of this conflict, if you try to, to look at this objectively, you know, I mean, Nixon is supposed to be ending this war. He dramatically escalates the bombing, and he's got his reasons for doing that. But the problem is that the more you bomb, the more you produce prisoners of war. Hmm. And, 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 and those prisoners are, I mean, they're, they're Hanoi's leverage over the United States. So, 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 you know, by 73, Nixon has, has good reason to also want to finalize an agreement, even if the terms of that agreement are far from, 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 from perfect. So, so, you know, I, 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 it, of course, everyone would claim victory, right, in, in, in 1973. Hanoi would, would claim victory. Uh, 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 Washington would claim victory. But but I really think kind of you know Saigon, which 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 really didn't think much of the agreement. That that perspective is 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 the one that I think each side kind of genuinely uh, uh, embraced. You know, Hanoi understood that 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 this agreement would probably be violated because it was still committed to reunifying Vietnam under under communist governance. Mm -hmm. Nixon, let's face it, never really cared about peace in Vietnam. He wants the prisoners back, and 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 I I do agree. He, he doesn't just want a decent interval for the South. He wants to give the South a fighting chance. Uh, but, you know, promises are made. But th I think that's that's the problem with, with Nixon's diplomacy also, is that is that he's making promises that that he knew could only be honored with the support from Congress. And so, you know, when people say that, well, you know, the, he didn't provide the assistance, the reconstruction aid that he promised. Well, I mean, you know, given how unpopular the war had become by by the early 70s. And, and as Neil points out, given how preoccupied by other parts of the world the US had become, you kind of had to expect that Congress would not be particularly keen on, on giving the North the, 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 the Vietnamese billions of dollars in reconstruction aid. So, so you know, it's 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 an agreement. And when you look at the Paris Agreement, it fulfills certain immediate needs for each of the main parties. But but as far as peace itself, I mean that agreement never really gave it a chance. Mm. Uh, Neil and Ronald, let me ask you the same question. Starting with you, Neil. Uh, briefly, how do you evaluate Nixon's performance? H how would you grade Nixon in terms of striking an honorable peace with the North Vietnamese? Well, I think it's important to give uh, due credit to Kissinger because he was the one who slogged his way through endless hours of negotiation and the secret talks with Lee Doc To. Remember, there were official talks going on in Paris, which were essentially a talking shop. 
Uh, but uh, Kissinger's rather 19th century belief in secret diplomacy did pay off. I don't think it would have been possible to have arrived at what was a compromise uh, uh, in the course of, of, of 72 and into 73 without that style of incredibly indefatigable, patient negotiation with the, the interlocutor he paid tribute to as the toughest person he'd ever had to to deal with. To simplify, and I have to simplify because there are so many pages and pages that one uh, would need to go through to give all the detail. To simplify, the United States uh, accepted that North Vietnamese uh, troops would remain in South Vietnam. But the South, uh, but the, the North Vietnamese accepted that they couldn't simply uh, depose Chu and that the South Vietnamese government would continue to exist. Those were the two major shifts that occurred relative to the positions in 69. The counterfactual that the peace could have been made in 69 can't be right, uh, because in 69, the, Viet the North Vietnamese wanted the South Vietnamese to be depo effectively deposed. Hmm. Uh, so that that's how they arrived at an agreement. And when one thinks of how long that took, and when one remembers the crucial role of escalation to close the deal, uh, then one has to say that, that Nixon achieved what he set out to achieve. Uh, he reduced the salience of the issue in domestic politics. He got American troops out, but he continued to exert sufficient military pressure that ultimately, as Pierre says, the North Vietnamese overcame their allergic aversion to precisely this kind of of agreement. And I want to reiterate that I don't think it was uh, a chronicle of a death foretold. I don't think one could say uh, in January of 1973, this won't last uh, and Q and, and the Saigon regime will be gone in a couple of years' time. I think that all depended on subsequent events and in particular depended on Nixon's collapse uh, domestically because of Watergate. Rana, what's your, what's your view? Um, well, if we're doing a report card, um, and uh, uh, I think that one has to be uh, to differentiate different elements, then there's one element that I think we can, perhaps with revisionism, give a pretty high grade to, maybe like an A, a slash B, or as we say in Oxford, alpha slash beta. Uh, Neil will remember that, I'm sure, from his days marking uh, undergraduate essays in uh, Oxford before he escaped to the glories of California. Um, but then there's a second part of the report card, which I'm afraid I think is an F, and I'll tell you what both parts are. I think it is fair to say that when we look at the reality of what was possible at that time in terms of an agreement with the Vietnamese, I don't know whether peace with honor was is necessarily the term we could use even now, but certainly it brought peace. And that was a very necessary and very important element of changing the geopolitical situation in a way that then enabled some of those bigger elements that we've talked about, notably, I think, actually contributing to the possibility of freeing up space bandwidth, as we would now say, for Nixon, Kissinger and others to deal with detente in Europe, for instance. I mean, we know from the present day that there is a limit to the number of things that any US administration or any other administration can think about at the same time, which I think is one reason why many people are hoping that we're not going to have a major crisis in East Asia at the same time as our existing major crisis in uh, Europe. We should come back, uh, we could come back to that. But I think in those terms, I would say that there is a good argument for saying that in the end, the Vietnamese, uh, the uh, Americans and the Chinese actually, I think, got really quite a lot out of what they would have wanted during that period. And the Soviets probably weren't massively unhappy either. So I think that that, that counts as a uh, as a plus in uh, de-escalating the, uh, 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 the crisis there. And I think also I'd agree with Neil, but um, there is in 1971-72, some realistic sense that a government in South Vietnam out of Saigon has some possibility of being supported and, uh, and maintained. I don't think that's um, a misleading position at all. But I do have to say something about what I would grade. Perhaps others will disagree. Very happy to have that if as, uh, as what I think does count as an F. And that is the bombing of Cambodia during the Nixon administration and with the Secretary of State, so the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State very much involved the decisions um, are on that too. There are a lot of retrospective arguments that could be made. There are obviously geostrategic arguments about the way in which uh, Narodom Sihanouk uh, played both sides in terms of the ability to use uh, Cambodia as a sort of backstage um, uh, 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 opportunity for um, the uh, revolutionaries, the Vietnam Vietnamese revolutionaries to put forward, uh, to to, to store arms and to uh, essentially launch uh, a second set of assaults. But 
That, I think, gets away from the fact that, nonetheless, this was a country that was essentially at peace, that directly because of the bombing of the country, ended up having uh, to deal with a very, very distinct political movement, the Khmer Rouge, which was not Vietnam, were well, not similar to what happened either in Vietnam or in Laos. And those two countries ended up with highly authoritarian communist governments. They've still got versions of that today. But Cambodia was subjected to something much, much worse than either of those. And while it would be wrong, you know, it's clearly misleading to suggest that the American bombing was the only factor that created that, one person who has to take blame for that is Mao, who famously met Pol Pot in um, Beijing in 1973 and told him, amongst other things, the mistake that I made when I took over China was not to empty out the cities uh, early on. I should have dealt with the cities very, very early on. And we know that Pol Pot certainly took that to uh, uh, took that to heart. But I think without the bombing, it's harder to see how you get to what becomes ultimately the Khmer genocide. And that has to be brought into the equation as well, I think. Thank you, Rana. Neil, Neil and, and Pierre, do you see Cambodia any differently than, than Rana just uh, talked I, about? I, 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 I do actually. I, I don't think I don't think Cambodia was ever at peace after 1945. You know, the for 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 I mean the for Vietnamese communist authorities, Indochina was one theater, right? So so they're 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 not just fighting uh for, for the liberation, quote unquote, of Vietnam. They're also fighting for the liberation of, of Cambodia and 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 Laos, right? And so 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 while while the, the, the Cambodian communist movement is very small. From the very beginning, it's, it's supported, enabled, and eventually enlarged because because the the the, the Vietnamese are 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 behind it. Uh, the the you know Nixon's bombing of Cambodia was savage. Uh, it it I mean it may very well have been a war crime, right? Under the circumstances, I mean, and it as to whether or not it caused the Khmer Rouge, I don't know. But but you know, in in the defense of American foreign policymakers, it was the the. The, the North Vietnamese who extended the war to Cambodia in rather dramatic fashion, starting in the late 50s, by using Cambodian territory to infiltrate men and supplies to support the insurgency, which then becomes big war in, in, in the South. So I think we've got to be careful here, right? You know, again, if, if we try to think of this as, as, as good historians, right, I, I, think, I think that you can't put everything on the Americans. I, I, I was making clear that I wasn't putting everything on the Americans. I mean, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just, yeah. just generally speaking, right? Like, like the shock Ross types who say that, you know, the Khmer Rouge and the genocide is all on, on, on Nixon. I think that's going too far. But at the same time, it's not just on the North Vietnamese, right? So, so, so various circumstances will, will contribute to, to, I mean, what we all have to agree on is, a, is an incredibly tragic fate for for Cambodia and its and its and its people. But it's in terms of determining who's really responsible, it's kind of a you know chicken in the egg kind of thing, right? I mean, technically, yes, the North Vietnamese you could say started, but then the Americans escalated in a way that maybe was not really kind of reasonable, right? But but I mean it's it's Cambodia becomes a, a, a victim of of circumstances. You know, its own leaders make bad choices, but then, but then at the same time, Vietnam, the, the Cambodia, Cambodians have to deal with with North and South Vietnam, the Americans, the Soviets, the Chinese, and and eventually kind of the international community. So, so, so again, various circumstances uh, end up creating a, a very sad situation for 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 Cambodia. I, I could have just one, one, one sentence to let me before I get nearly, which is that nonetheless, history shows that the Vietnamese communist movement and indeed the Lao communist movement did not become genocidal, even though they are very abusive of, of human rights and authoritarian. The Cambodian one did. We should look at the range of reasons as to why that happened. I'll just add, Mark, if I may. To me, it's remarkable that William Shawcross, who wrote that uh, very influential study, uh, Sideshow, has repudiated. Uh, the argument in in recent years, uh, I think the notion that there's a direct causal link from particularly the secret bombing to the advent of Pol Pot is, uh, I think that's not right. And even he now acknowledges that that's not right. But I want to come back to the point about the hierarchy of strategic priorities. Mm -hmm. Much of the criticism of Richard Nixon's foreign policy uh, zeroes in on a particular country. Uh, we could equally well talk about uh, the human uh, cost of uh, of the, the the Bangladesh case, and I think it's very easy to find uh, bad things that happened in the 1970s uh, under uh, Ford and Carter too. 
Uh, but the problem I have with these uh, historical accounts is that they they omit the broader strategic picture, uh, just as uh, Hitchens in his trial of Henry Kissinger barely mentions the Soviet Union at all. I think it's mentioned mm. twice in the entire book. When one puts the the cases, Cambodia or Bangladesh, or for that matter, Chile, the notorious cases, into the broader strategic framework, one understands why these were not high priorities. A, not much time was spent discussing the future domestic political order of Cambodia. Uh, they consciously turned a blind eye to atrocities in Bangladesh because they regarded the Pakistani regime as vital uh, to their China strategy. And I could go on. Uh, Kissinger, before he became national security advisor, wrote that foreign policy was mostly the choice uh, between evils. And one had to try to choose greater and lesser, greater uh, lesser over greater evil in in the foreign policy process. Many academics forget this uh, and imply, not not often very credibly, counterfactuals in which everybody uh, lives happily ever after in all the different countries concerned. And, and we who study foreign policy rigorously and think historically know that in 1969 uh, there was no way to foresee. Uh, what Cambodia's fate would be. Indeed, probabilistically, you'd have thought it quite unlikely that a communist movement in a, in a country in Indochina would become genocidal. Uh, this was quite a surprising outcome of, of events in Cambodia that certainly nobody in Washington uh, was thinking about uh, with, the, uh, with the decision to escalate uh, the war into Cambodia, or rather to, to recognize that the North Vietnamese had already made Cambodia part of the war. We have about 15 minutes left in the discussion. I wish we could continue. Uh, but several people have asked uh, about lessons learned. A, a lot has happened in the world since the Paris Peace Accords were signed 50 years ago. The Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union. We saw that America once again could get bogged down in military quagmires in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. And now Russia has invaded Ukraine in an attempt to once again expand the, the, the Russian sphere. So I'd like to ask each of you, what was the what are the principal lessons that we can draw from Vietnam as we consider America's role in the 21st century? And Pierre, we'll start with you. I think I think going back to a point that that Neil raised earlier and that a colleague of mine here said Diego Greg Dadis has been making in his own writings. I mean, th there are limits to American power. There are things that 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 no matter how how great you think you are, you'll never be able to 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 achieve. Particularly if you're facing an enemy like 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 the Vietnamese who were who were dogmatically committed to this. And I, I want to emphasize one thing here. You know, when you look at the Vietnam War and that kind of the, the relentlessness of, of 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 the of the of the of America's enemies, it, it, this is not you know an organic thing by the Vietnamese, right? You know, the the the, the, the young men and women who were fighting against the Americans for the most part were, were 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 fighting for the same reasons that Americans were fighting because they were told to by their leaders. So 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 you know the, what the Vietnam War underscores is that when you're facing a leadership stubbornly committed to a particular objective, which also happens to be ideologically driven, uh, you're going to get a run for your your your, your money. Because, because, you know, I, I mean, when you look back on, on all of this, you know, the, yes, the U.S. caused massive death in Vietnam and could have ended the war sooner, but so could have Hanoi. And so so understanding your enemy is really, really important. And to me, that that that's a lesson the U.S. has completely failed to to learn from, from Vietnam, right? We America has gone to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, claiming to be fighting evildoers, terrorists, and this and that, never recognizing that conceivably these enemies might be well uh, better uh, organized than, than we think. And we're seeing the same thing right now in, in, in Ukraine. We, we keep discrediting the Russians. The military is weak. Putin is old. He's going to die. Uh, we're going to start coming to our senses here when you look at other powers that that we happen to have conflicting interests with and kind of learn to appreciate them on their own on their own terms. So I think for Americans generally, American foreign policymakers specifically, I think unfortunately, very little was learned about 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 the American experience in 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 Vietnam. Before I ask uh, Neil and Rana the same question, why haven't we learned that lesson, Pierre? I, th I think, you know, I mean, for the same reasons that the Americans got into Vietnam after the French, right? You, somehow you always think that now we're smarter, we're better, we're going to do things differently, and 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 and, and we're going to win. And 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 you know, we we always interpret history to fit our own purposes, right? 
I, I would say, I mean, if anybody has learned anything from the Vietnam War, it's Zelensky right now, because the way he's engaging the world, it's very much like the North Vietnamese War at the time, right? Kind of claiming that, oh, I haven't done anything wrong. You know, we're poor people. We're waging a people's war. You know, we 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 have it, and so and we're you know we're we're fighting war criminals. I mean, I mean, I mean, Zelensky is is doing everything Hanoi did, right? And 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 he's he's succeeding, and he's he's taking advantage of tensions in the West between the Americans and Europeans to get all of them to give them everything that they he could he could he could possibly use. And 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 to me, that the resonance between the way Zelensky is behaving. And how the the North Vietnamese were behaving at the height of the war, right? Trying to again play that 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 innocent victim card, which is to an extent true, but not all true, is is fascinating. So 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 I think I think he's learned his lesson, right? Hanoi invited invited Gene Fonda, Zelensky's inviting Ben Stiller, right? So that there's a lot of parallels here. But I think as far as American foreign policymakers and I guess Russian policymakers also, very little has been learned from the war in its totality. And the only time that. Jane Fonda will ever get compared to Ben Stiller. Thank you. <laughs> Rana, what do you think the, the principal lesson we should take from Vietnam for in 21st century America should be? Well, I think I would give three, but three very short ones, which come together and I think are drawn from our experience here. The first one is that 50 years on from the Paris Peace Accords and from the Nixon administration, Regardless of what you think of the effects of the foreign policy decisions made at that time, and you have gathered that I think that some are very admirable and others, you know, I still don't find actually worked out. But step aside from that for a moment and look at the level of craft that was involved in trying to see a hugely complex, holistic picture in the sum of the parts. I mean, this is an administration that had to deal with crises in the Middle East, in Europe, in South America, in Asia. In, South, in East Asia, in South Asia, um, and juggle them all in various ways. And in many very important areas, I mentioned detente, I'll say it again, um, South Asia ultimately as well. And as we're talking about here in, in Vietnam, managed to lower the temperature. If you look back at the how, how the Cold War looks now, there's some very, very, very dangerous times in the early 60s. There's some pretty darn dangerous times in the 1980s. And the 1970s does, in many aspects, not all, but many of them seem to be a period when detente was real. And you have to give a great deal of credit to the presidency of Richard Nixon and uh, Kissinger and others involved in creating that. But the other two things I'd say almost almost form a contradiction, but those of you who spent time reading Chinese Chinese Marxism will know that Mao Dun, or contradiction, is a good Hegelian Marxist term the Chinese, even to this day, like to uh, to use. So I'd say that there are two things, and they're contradictory things, that you can learn, um, which uh, makes sense today. The first is how important ideology is. I mean, I think I entirely agree with Pierre that Young men, mostly men, not entirely, of course, uh, in uh, the United States, but certainly actually, of course, in, in uh, Indochina, the uh, recruitment of at least some uh, women revolutionary soldiers was an important part of the movement too. But mostly young men being sent to the front line by their governments was because they were told to do that because people had strong ideological beliefs. But I also would not underestimate the reality in all societies of how much these beliefs really do matter to people. And I think, you know, it's become a cliche, but it's worth noting that the inability of uh, much of the American analytic, uh, policy uh, analytical establishment to understand that the Vietnamese idea about themselves was not simply a product of communism per se or even the Cold War structures, but to do with the specificities of Vietnamese history, I think is one lesson that we can apply to a whole variety of other places as well, not simply to accept it, but to put it into the mix. But the final thing, which, as I said, almost kicks against the first one, but I think is always worth knowing, noting too, is that you can also get too seduced by the idea that ideology tells you what you need to know, whether it's communism or a particular form of uh, uh, Islamist uh, related uh, radicalism or whatever it might be. And the evidence I'll give for that is the aftermath to this, which of course is the last of the Vietnam Wars 
the Sino-Vietnamese War, um, which broke out most notably in 1979 for a, a short um, period, uh, during which when, I think it's come correct to say, when President Carter asked Deng Xiaoping what on earth he thought he was doing, he replied, we're spanking the Vietnamese butt uh, in, uh, in Chinese. Uh, and uh, this was clearly a, a territorial dispute, but also one about who was going to be the ideological, uh, rather the kind of nationalistic victor between the two sides. But the fact that both regimes clearly shared, shared a whole variety of ideological precepts didn't prevent them going to war any more than the Soviet or the Chinese uh, similarities in the 1950s so stopped them splitting in the, in the 60s. So ideology definitely does matter is one thing that I think I would take from this period. But ideology is not the only thing that matters or sometimes it'll take you in surprising directions is the other side of what I think I've learned. Neil, the major lesson you would take away from Vietnam and apply to the 21st century? Well, I'll give you four briefly. The first is that the US did learn the lessons of Vietnam, only to forget them. I think it's important to recognize that in the 1980s and the 1990s, radical changes occurred uh, in the US military as well as in the political elite. Uh, the shift to an all-volunteer force, for example, uh, was a, a radical change. The reluctance uh, of successive administrations uh, from Reagan through to Clinton uh, to become involved in a large scale uh, in any major conflict, even when, as for example in Lebanon, large numbers of American uh, uh, casualties uh, were inflicted. The odd thing is that all the lessons that were learned then that continued to constrain policymakers right through the Bosnian War up to Kosovo were forgotten in the wake of 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, anecdote, uh, and a me member of George W. Bush's administration, quite a senior member, read the first volume of my Kissinger biography and wrote to me uh, in somewhat awestruck tones saying, as he read the chapters on Kissinger's early visits to Vietnam and Kissinger's critique of the American operation in Vietnam, he was stunned to find that it almost uh, exactly resembled what had gone wrong in Iraq. And I found it amazing that he was amazed. So we had a kind of strange amnesia uh, after 9-11 and, and found ourselves therefore forgetting the lessons of, of Vietnam. Uh, and I think that explains a lot of what went wrong in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Uh, a, a couple more final uh, reflections. It is generally easier to start a war than to stop one. Mm. And this is highly relevant to the situation in Ukraine today. Uh, I have just come from the World Economic Forum last week. I heard a great deal of uh, enthusiastic, indeed passionate rhetoric and support of President Zelensky. I yield to no one in my admiration for him and for the heroism of the Ukrainian people. But nobody that I heard uh, had a good answer to the question, how does this end? And that is a huge problem. Uh, and I think the lesson we can learn from studying the Nick's administration is just how hard it is uh, to end a war. And finally, I agree with Pierre. There's much of North Vietnam about Ukraine today, but there's also a bit of South Vietnam. When I was last in Kyiv in September, I said to Zelensky and his people, you want to be North Vietnam. Fighting while talking worked for them. But you've got to be very careful not to become South Vietnam, a mm. corrupt administration reliant on American weapons and support. That, that reliance could be fatal if you expect it to be indefinite. And surely the lesson of this discussion is that you can have that kind of support for a while, but it's never going to be open-ended, no matter who's president. Neil, let me ask a question that was asked by a member of the audience relating to what you just said. Is peace with honor possible in Ukraine? I think it is. I think it's already, in a sense, achievable now because Ukraine has done so much better than anybody expected. And Kissinger himself, who, of course, is still with us commenting on these events, uh, said at Davos, Ukraine has, in effect, won. It has shown the uh, the limits and vulnerability of what we once overrated, Russian military power, and it's established itself as a as a military power and as a nation, which, uh, which is a victory in its own right. The challenge for President Zelensky is to lock in that victory uh, and not assume that this war can be continued to maximalist uh, ends, which can only, I think, be achieved with the unconditional surrender of Russia. I find it highly implausible that Ukraine, even with... Western tanks can achieve such an emphatic victory that it can return itself to the status quo anti-2014. So there must be some realism amidst the patriotic fervor in Kyiv. And I'm afraid to say at the moment, I don't yet detect it. Uh, Pierre, 
Rana, we have about three minutes left. Do you see it any differently in, in, in Ukraine? Do you think that peace with honor is possible? You know, I, 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 first of all, I think, I think, you know, if, if we, if we draw from Vietnam, I think Ukraine could conceivably win, but, but consider what the Vietnamese had to sacrifice to win, right? So we're talking about basically two to three million people, uh, and then a completely devastated country. So, 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 you know, for, 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 for those of us who advocate for a Ukrainian victory, it has to be clear here that, 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 that it, it, it's certainly doable. But but if history serves is any indication, uh, we're, we're we're talking about a conflict that will last a very very long time and be immensely costly to mm -hmm. to the Ukrainians, right? And I I can't help but think of looking at Ukraine, you know, and, and how it's been internationalized, and think about Vietnam and what the Vietnamese would say after the Vietnam War, right? That that looking back, that's the Vietnamese themselves, right? They would say that the Russians, the Americans, the Chinese were willing to wage this war to the last Vietnamese. And I'm looking at our approach to Ukraine, and it's we're so enthusiastic about it, uh, and to, to the point where it's almost like you know we, we really don't care about the Ukrainians. We just want them. It's it's become a cause, right? And it's I, I'm afraid that that we're going to be supporting that to to the last Ukrainian. Peace is definitely possible, but but it, it will require compromise. It will require some hard choices, and above all, it will require international collaboration. But right now, to me, the West is so driven to to humiliate Russia that 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 I I just I just don't 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 see the prospects for for peace hopefully cooler heads are going to prevail uh uh but but they 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 there will have to be some some tough choices to be made as in the case of, of in, in 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 any successful negotiation Ronnie we have about 30 seconds for you to give us the last word uh, in that case, I think the very last word was with great points from both the um, other panelists, from Pierre and uh, Neil. And I would say it's absolutely possible, but it can't be done clearly in a bilateral way. This has to be a major international effort, and all sides are going to have to pitch in on that. Rana, Pierre, Neil, thank you for a fascinating discussion. And back to you at the Nixon Foundation.